So along came Christmas time. Now Christmas was very important at 11. I mean, people came and gave me, you know, they gave you presents. When you're 11 years old, you are an unabashed materialist. You do not, you do not apologize for your desire for material things. It's very rare that a kid apologizes to his own man. Well, uh, you see, uh, Dad, I, I hate to admit it, uh, <laughs> you know, you asked me what I wanted for Christmas. Well, uh, let's see, I'd like to start with a 10-speed Italian bike, and uh, no way is he going to apologize for that. He just, this is what he wants. So I am 11, and I had this aunt, uh, my Aunt Glenn. Now, they were pretty well off. My Aunt Glenn, she had this, husband, who was my Uncle Tom. You have not heard me talk much about my Uncle Tom. He was a mysterious uncle. Uh, Every family has a kind of a mysterious uncle who who only makes an occasional ritualistic appearance, like at a wedding, uh, at a funeral, uh, at Christmas. They arrive in a car, and then they they depart. And uh, my Uncle Tom was a large man who wore vests. Now, nobody else in my my family ever wore a vest, but he had this black vest with a chain across it. It impressed me fantastically when I was a kid. Had this gold chain, and hanging on a chain was a large tooth. He was uh, a member of of a lodge, and it had a tooth. He was an elk. (laughs) And he had this, this tooth that was apparently an elk's tooth. And it was a really biggie. And uh, so he was a very official uncle, and he was reputedly a bootlegger. Well, we never really talked much about that at the age of 11. One does not discuss the financial uh, resources of one's uncle. They're just there. He's an uncle. So my Uncle Tom came over every Christmas, and my Aunt Gwen, and they would have these great gifts for me and my kid brother. You got it. Because they had a little dough, see, and they, they would really great gifts they'd come out with. Up to that point. Now remember, prior to age 11, I was still pretty much in the same general class as Tommy Van Hoos. Up to that point, I had been a walking around kid, but now I have, uh, you know, things have changed. Uh, the yeast has uh, begun to flow in the veins, various other things. My, uh, my uh, brains are beginning to solidify and, and vague ideas are beginning to come through. So I am no longer a basic kid. Well, on this 11th, this particular 11th Christmas, the big day came, and it was, it was on Christmas Day. Now, all of our Christmas gifts in our family were always exchanged on Christmas Eve. You know, two different types of, of family. We had the Christmas Eve thing. And, yeah, we never had the, the Christmas Day was not our bag. Christmas Day was the day we went over to see my grandmother. And that was a bore, a fantastic bore as a kid. I hated that. But we'd all go to see my grandmother, and, and they, we'd sit around, and, and uh, they would have uh, turkey and all that kind of stuff. And, and uh, I had to wear this, uh, this uh, you know, my mother put me in a, a shirt and all that jazz. Well, but Christmas Eve was something else. Christmas Eve was when all the gifts were around. Well, always, Christmas morning, my Aunt Glenn and my Uncle Tom would arrive in the car. Well, they did. They arrived this Christmas, it's 11. Now, this is the point of total trauma. I just want to warn you, this story is sickening. It is sickening. And I don't want anybody to write in and say, Shepard, it was a sickening story. Why are you telling that to to kids and, and, and ladies listening on Christmas? Well, it's a warning, because a lot of you are going to go out and get Christmas gifts over this weekend, and I want to warn you, if you've got a kid that's between 11, 10, and 13, be careful. You're liable to give that kid a scar, and he's liable to hate you for the rest of his life, and you won't know it, because he'll fake it. He will fake it. And so Christmas morning was cold. Temperature was maybe five below zero, as it often is in northern Indiana at this time of the year. The wind was howling down from Canada, coming down the Lake Michigan there like a gigantic force of nature, which it was bringing with it nothing but stygian, cold, tremendously icy air. It was whistling down, 
and everything for miles around was covered with long, heavy icicles. In fact, we had icicles that would go from the roof of this house we lived in all the way to the ground sometimes, these great big wide babies. And, oh, <laughs> and sometimes northern Indiana being what it was, those icicles would not melt until late July. Ooh, the wind is roaring down, and all excited, see, it's, uh, it's Christmas morning, and all the papers all over the floor, you know, with the, the, the Christmas presents of the night before, and all of our stuff is laying out, we, the loot that we had gotten, me and my kid brother are whooping it up and yelling and hollering, and the Christmas tree is smelling like a Christmas tree smells. And at 10 o'clock that morning, that afternoon, we were going to my grandmother's house. But the one big bright spot of Christmas Day, not only, you know, all the stuff you got, but the fact that my Aunt Glenn and Uncle Tom came over, and this could be, let's say, a big bonus jackpot, as it had so often in the past before. I'll never forget the time my Aunt Glenn scored heavily with a thing. Did you ever hear of Lincoln Logs? Did you ever hear of Lincoln Logs? Well, I got this set of Lincoln Logs from my Aunt Glenn one time. Lincoln Logs, you know what they do? They're logs with little notches in them. And you put them together. You just put them together. You make all kinds of things. You can make forts. You can make houses. <laughs> and, so, and, I, and I must have been about eight. That was a fantastic gift. It was really great. Another time, she laid on me a fantastic gift, which even at this time, I wish I had it. It, 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 it would... It would bring a little, uh, little of the roses in my cheeks in the office one one day. You know, when the salesman would have been particularly obnoxious that day, I'd like to sit there and put together my erector set again, and uh, you know, just sit there and, and, and plunge into the world of the erector set. Did you ever have one? Well, my aunt Glenn gave me an erector set, the Model 14 erector set, which had in it an electric motor. That was the the primo. Electric, yeah, that was the real electric, you know, that was the real erector set, because you could make a uh, Ferris wheel, hook the motor up, and a Ferris wheel would go around like Billy Bee Dan. Of course, the problem is it didn't have any gears in it, and when you, when you started this, this uh, it was like uh, having a gigantic wearing blender right in the middle of the living room, built, uh, it just went around, I tell you, it chewed up the rug and everything else, but it was there, and it was a great gift, so, so she had a reputation as a great gift giver until this morning. It was 10 o'clock in the morning. The wind was blowing, and Aunt Glenn and Uncle Tom drove up the driveway in their car, this big black car, this Buick. And they came up bearing gifts, big boxes in their arms, you know, oh, fantastic. They always had a gift from my old man, like one... Uh, one great uh, Christmas, uh, Uncle Tom gave my old man a new jack for his car. Since my old man was always having flats, that was a terrific gift. It was a, it was a presentation model jack and an ivory handle. Beautiful. Came in a lizard skin case. And uh, that was a great gift. Uh, they used to give my mother great gifts, like, uh, oh, like uh, lingerie. You should have seen her hanging over the sink in this pink lingerie with black, <laughs> black touches, you know, hanging out with Brillo pads with the sink squirting coffee grounds all over her. But that was, you know, that was, these were great gifts. On this particular night, or morning, things changed, and I never looked at the world quite the same after that. Aunt Glenn says, and now for you, Merry Christmas. She hands me this box. It was a big box. It wasn't very heavy, though. And she turns to my kid brother and says, and for you, Randy, here's your gift. She hands him a box. His box was not much bigger than mine, but uh, it was very heavy. So we both says, oh, thanks. She says, are you going to open it? Silly question. Are we going to open it? So my kid brother, immediately, he's got these claws. He's, he, he, being a couple of years younger than I was, you see, he was basically uncivilized. He just grabs his box, ah, he tears it open, you know, the paper flies. He got this magnificent low-winged airplane, a beautiful airplane. I wish I had it now. Man, if I had that airplane, uh, it would be a great collector's item. He was a beautiful low-winged airplane, 
and it had pontoons. It was a seaplane. And not only was it a seaplane, but the thing was beautifully made. I, I, it's, it's a great piece of thing. Oh, I looked at it. Oh, great. You know, and, and, and it had a, a, you could wind it up. It was made out of very light metal. And you could wind it up, and this thing would go over the water. The propeller would go. And it was a seaplane. It had little pontoons. Oh, what a great gift. And my brother says, wow, we, you know, and he grabs this thing and he runs in. He starts putting, uh, putting uh, water in the, in the bathtub. And for th months after that, he would sit there with this pontooned airplane going around him in his bathtub, you know. It's always taxiing constantly around him. <laughs> this thing is about ready to take off. He would not take a bath unless his airplane was in the tub with him. And he could wind it up and let it go. And it would just go around. The thing just went, oh, what a beautiful little thing. Well, I figured, well, if my kid brother is getting such a fantastic thing as a an airplane that goes, and you put it in a bathtub and it taxis and everything else, it was a real airplane. I was really into my airplane phase at that time. Can you imagine what kind of a gift I'm going to get? So I said, gee, that's, that's, uh, that's, Thank you, Aunt Glenda, Uncle Tom. Uh, okay, I'll open it up. And uh, Hey, Ma, <laughs> Aunt Glenda, give me a gift. Well, I take the paper off. I should have known. I should have known. The paper should have ticked me off. Should have ticked me off right there. The paper was white with red candy canes all over it. Be careful of anybody who gives you a gift that has candy canes printed on the paper. That's just a, just a suggestion, because I'm a great Christmas gift uh, aficionado of the style and the school of various gifts. So I carefully take this paper off, and it was a box, a Christmas-type box that was about, oh, I would say a foot wide. It was about six, seven inches deep and about four or five inches high. I said, gee, uh, well, I wonder what's inside. And she says, oh, you're going to be surprised. That's something I know you're going to you're going to really enjoy having. My Uncle Tom just stands over there looking official, and he's talking to the old man, and they're drinking Jim Bean, <laughs> which is what Christmas was about to, to the grown-up type man. You know, they're sitting there drinking this Jim Bean. Ho, ho, ho. Well, I take the top of the box off, and there is nothing but tissue paper all covering this thing up. Tissue paper. I still see that tissue paper because what a trauma it brought on. What a trauma it brought on, that tissue paper. And some nights at 3, 4 o'clock in the morning, I look up at the ceiling. And I can peer through the vast, swirling snows and fogs and dreary mists of time. And I see that tissue paper. That accursed white tissue paper that hid that obscenity. Little did I realize that I was about to experience a moment in my life where I would cease forever to be a kid and forever become an embittered adult. Set that, Joe, if you will, please. Uh, that moment, that moment, white tissue paper, and I took the corner of it and I pulled it back, and at first it looked, I couldn't believe, you know, what, what the hell? Is it three guinea pigs looking out at me? What? I could see beady eyes looking at me. Beady eyes! And it was a wild thrill at first that went through me like I've hit the jackpot. Because if there's one thing my mother didn't want was animals around the house. She couldn't stand that thing. I thought for one minute, oh my God, I've got that. It's a, it's a, what is it? Is it, is it looks like a little bear or something. I've got, and I, what the? And there, in that box, surrounded by white tissue, were two furry bunny slippers with ears. Slippers.
slippers, bedroom slippers, made in the form of bunnies. Yellow fur. With two little beady eyes on the toes. With little fake mustaches. <laughs> you know, the little whiskers that bunnies have? And the ears went back over the ankle. Two blue ears. What hurt it? My aunt Glenn says, well, for, for cold mornings when you're getting ready to go to school, I thought that these cute little bunny slippers would, would just be what you want. And I could hear in the bathroom my kid brother yelling and hollering, his airplane going, <laughs> Wow, look at these clothes, it's taking off! Oh, God, I got a pair of bunny slippers. Bunny slippers. Do you realize that bunny slippers are things which a three-year-old kid is already beginning to outgrow? Where the devil she got a pair of bunny slippers that would fit an, a, an 11-year-old kid who wore roughly size 22 shoes, I don't know. And then, the worst part of this, my mother says, Oh, how wonderful! Put them on! I sat down there on the sofa, and I had to. I had a fake it. I said, Oh, gee, they're really nice. Yeah. <laughs> bunny slippers, boy. <laughs> Oh, they're really great. Uh, yeah, uh, bunny slippers. My mother says, put them on, put them on. I said, yeah, well, uh, I had to do it. I put on these two bunny slippers, and I walked around wearing these two bunnies on my feet. Do you realize how humiliating this is? Bunnies on my feet. Well, I went into the bathroom, and my kid brother saw these two bunnies coming in. He said, what are they? What? He figured there were two small animals coming in. And I said, no, the slippers. And we played with the airplane for half an hour. I was bugged. I wanted to steal it from him. Have you ever had your brother had something you wanted to... No way. He didn't let that... Do you know that he still owns that airplane? My brother still owns that airplane. He will not even still to this day let me get near it. Well, every time company came over for at least six months, my mother made me put on the bunny slippers. My Aunt Glenn would come and visit us every couple of Sundays. She'd say, now, now, don't forget, when your Aunt Glenn comes, put on the bunny slippers. I'd say, oh, no, bunny slippers. And I'll never forget the time that Lawrence Stryker, the magnificent human being across the street who had the purple letter with the white H, saw me in my bunny slippers. The word got around the neighborhood. Shepherd wears bunny slippers. He's a secret bunny slipper wearer. And I'll tell you, it took me years to outgrow that, and only at the point when I started to grow large shoulders and started to run over small yelling kids did the bunny slipper legend vaguely die, but it's never completely left my soul. So be careful. If you have a male-type kid between the ages of 10 and 13, be careful what you give them. Don't lay any that cutesy poo stuff on him. If you give him a copy, a leather-bound copy of Raggedy Ann and Raggedy Andy and the camel with the wrinkled knees, you've lost a friend for life. And in fact, you may well have made a dangerous enemy. So just front as a part of our public service programming, you ought to know that there are some pitfalls to Christmas that... Uh, Oh, incidentally, I just want to tell you, you just don't go outgrow these things. Two years ago, I'm talking to my mother Christmas on a telephone. She says, oh, say, uh, by the way, Jeannie, I says, yes, Mom. She says, say, you'll never guess what I ran across in your old room. She said, I'm going to send them to you. I, got, I ran across your old bunny slippers. You remember I used to love them? I said, yeah, Ma. You know, you carried it. Yeah, Ma. Like for years, I carried out a, a myth with my mother that I actually loved peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. Because she thought I did. I hated them. What I dug was Twinkies and Yoo-Hoo. And fudge sick as the hell with peanut butter and jelly. So be careful, peoples. Be careful. Be careful.